When people think of who is to thank for skateboarding's massive success, the first name most people come out with is, is Tony Hawk. Yo, do a kickflip! Do a kickflip! From the X Games to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, Tony is most people's obvious choice. And now whilst there's no doubt that Tony Hawk is a massive part of skateboarding success, there is one person whose name many people have never heard of, and that is Stacy Peralta. Now hold on a second, before all of the actual skateboarders who are watching this video kick off and get angry at me, I am aware that Stacy Peralta isn't a forgotten name in the world of skateboarding. But you see, outside of the world of skateboarding, most people probably don't even know who he is. Wait. Are you the Stacy Peralta? That's me. Stacy was not only at one point the best skateboarder on the planet, but he is arguably the brains behind the insane success of skateboarding and kind of the culture of extreme sports. So in today's video, I want to tell the story of one of my personal icons, Stacy Peralta. Stacy Douglas Peralta, born October 15th, 1957, and grew up in Venice, California. Venice was a semi-ghetto, and it was all working class people to very low class, and it was a, a rough and tumble place. It used to be this super famous tourist attraction, but ended up as this rundown place filled with violence and crime. But it, it was pretty good for surfboarding. It was a major surf town, like that was the whole culture of the area. But between about the 50s and the 60s, surfboarders had started this kind of new activity, which they called sidewalk surfing. At roughly age five, Stacy would one day go to a thrift shop where he and a friend would buy a pair of roller skates for about $2. I'd take one skate, he'd take the other, cut them in half, we'd bolt them to our boards. You see, at this time, skateboarding was like the backup activity. It was the thing you would do when you couldn't surf. When the waves were low, you would just go out and sidewalk surf. The area that Stacy started skateboarding was called Dogtown, where there was a local surf shop called Jeff Ho Surfboards and Zephyr Productions. And as time would pass, the Zephyr shop noticed how good Stacy was at skateboarding. And at age 15, he got invited to join their team called the z -Bots. In 1975, there was a team called Bain Skateboards. They were hosting the first big major skateboarding competition in years. The Zephyr shop decided they wanted to put a team forward, and your boy Stacy was on that team. The Z-Boys arrived at that competition, and they skated weird and different to everyone else, and they had no respect for anyone or anything. And this was in contrast to the rest of skateboarding at the time. Skateboarding was very polished. Everyone was really well behaved and kind of dorky. It, it just didn't look very cool. So when the Z-Boys saw this, they thought, Frank that. And they decided to like lean into their surf skateboarding style that they had developed through skating these like concrete and asphalt slopes they would find in school playgrounds. Having come from the deprived area of Dogtown, they had grown up around poverty and violence. The tight shorts and the handstands didn't really appeal to them. This attitude that the Z-Boys brought to skateboarding would totally redefine the sport, down to like what it meant to be a skateboarder. And from this moment, skateboarding took a completely different direction. Skateboarding would become counterculture. It was anti-establishment. And somehow from Stacy and the Z-Boys swearing at parents and drawing graffiti on the walls, they kind of unintentionally created this new subculture of like street sports. Skateboarding was this like lifestyle sport, more akin to an art form than it was like a traditional competitive sport. But anyway, back to Stacy in particular. Of all the Z-Boys, Stacy was the one who really started to excel. 20? 20, well you're very young to be a world champion, aren't you? He would do better and better at competitions and over time, manufacturers would start to recognize his talent. And so Stacy and the rest of the Z-Boys would start to be offered very lucrative sponsorships from big manufacturers. And just like that, the Zephyr shop, who had put all this hard work into sourcing this talent and getting it out there, well, everyone left the Z-Boys because they were offered more money elsewhere. And the Zephyr shop very sadly closed in 1977. At this point, everything would change for Stacy. All of a sudden, Stacy had become this like sensation in the world of skateboarding and beyond it. He would have his own model warp tail skateboard, which would outsell every other skateboard in the market. He would appear in films like Freewheeling, Charlie's Angels. What is that? It's a skateboard. And very quickly, he had become the most commercially successful skateboarder on the planet. You see, there was something about Stacy that was just quite different to all of the other very talented skateboarders of the time. All of 
of his life, Stacy had seen people that he had grown up with. Very talented surfers, artists, skateboarders. He would see all these people not utilize their potential and just wind up never leaving Dogtown. And they would get trapped in like the beach bum lifestyle, slamming special brews at 9 a.m. in the morning. And when it happened, um, I realized, well, I'm very lucky. This is a really lucky break and this could be a doorway to the world, so I took it very seriously. And I knew that you can be seduced by the fame and the money and you can start believing, yes, I am this cool, yes, I am this amazing, yes, this is gonna last the rest of my life, and it doesn't. He had a maturity and like a professionalism that many of the other skateboarders he grew up with just lacked. And in 1979, Stacy would be ranked the number one skateboarder on earth by the skateboarder magazine's worldwide community poll. Stacy was at the top of his game, making a ton of money, traveling the world, revolutionizing the sport, and then out of nowhere, Stacy decided to quit. This was a shock to everyone around him. Why would you quit at the absolute peak of your career? Before we go any further, I want to give a massive shout out to Anchor for sponsoring today's video with their Anchor Nano Pro. I can't tell you how many times I found myself in a situation where I have like half an hour to charge my phone before I have to go out. And I try desperately, but I get like 10% charged. The Anchor Nano Pro provides full speed, 20 watt USB-C charging for the latest iPhone. So if you have an iPhone 12 or a 12 Pro, you can charge it from 0% to 50% in just 26 minutes. That's literally three times faster than the standard five watt charger. It also has the Active Shield safety system, which provides all-time protection while charging, with continuous temperature monitoring and output control to protect your connected device. As well, it's 50% smaller than your standard iPhone 20 watt charger. So the Anker Nano Pro provides more power while saving you space in your bag or, or just plugged into the wall. I can't tell you how much of a game changer this thing has been. Like, I was honestly kind of amazed how quickly it charges things. I don't feel like I have to worry as much if I'm going to run out of battery when I'm out and about. As long as I've got this on me, I feel kind of comfortable that I'm going to be alright. So be sure to pick up your Anker Nano Pro today by checking the links in the description. Not only do you get a really good charger, but it also massively helps me out. So check the links below and back to the video. Well, Stacy understood something that no one around him seemed to get, and that was that being a peak performing skateboarder was only going to last for so long, especially with how the industry at that time worked. In order to make a living of skateboarding back then, you would need to be at the top of your game and constantly winning competitions. From winning, you would then get like magazine articles written about you, which would attract sponsors and then you would make money. But how long can you really do that for? Especially when everyone around you is trying to take your position. Stacy wanted a career that was going to be sustainable. So this got Stacy thinking and he came up with an idea. For a few years before he actually quit, he was talking to people, making connections with people who were like in the manufacturing side of skateboarding. You know, the side where the real money was at. And eventually he would strike a friendship with a man by the name of George Powell. Now George Powell wasn't a skater himself. He was an aerospace engineer. But George had gotten into designing skateboards for his son who was a skater. So in 1979, the same year that Stacy retired from being a pro, he and George Powell started Powell and Peralta. George would be like the, the product guy. He focused on making a mean skateboard, whereas Stacy would manage athletes and head up the marketing. I had no education whatsoever to run a business. Right. I had no education about what advertising was, marketing was, product strategies were, any of that stuff. Um, I learned everything by paying attention. He would look at the industry as a whole and kind of see what it was lacking. And one of the things that he noticed it was lacking was like a representation of skateboarding's camaraderie. So what I mean by that is basically every Every skateboarding brand at the time would just cherry pick the best skateboarders from around and dangle a ton of money in front of them until they joined their team. The best skateboarders would just hop around teams like a game of musical chess. It was just purely transactional. If you paid me enough money, I'd join your team. But Stacy could see, before anyone else did, that at its core, skateboarding wasn't this competitive team-based sport like football or basketball or baseball. It was a sport built on young people creating memories with their friends, redefining the purpose of architecture and turning the world into a playground. With this in mind, Stacy would jump in his car and tour all over America in search of like unknown skateboarders that no one had ever heard of. He would go to amateur competitions whilst all the competitor skateboarding brands would obviously just go to the professional competitions, you know, so they could get the good skateboarders. And after traveling up and down the country, he had assembled this Avengers-esque team of no-name skateboarders. No name skateboarders who were extremely young, wearing pads that were like twice the size of them. No one could really understand what Stacy was doing. But the thing is, Stacy was looking for something in particular. He was looking for skateboarders who were unique. And more than that, he was looking for kids who 
took skateboarding seriously. He wasn't just picking like the competition winners. In fact, he would often know if someone was gonna have a future in the sport by how they handled losing. The ones who were upset and disappointed in themselves, they were the ones that Stacy would choose because he knew to them, it mattered. And amongst these kids would be some of the most iconic skateboarders to ever live. Tony Hawk, Rodney Mullen, Lance Mountain, and, and many, many more. And I took a chance, but I was willing to put up with the grief, the misunderstanding, the insecurity of it, yep. because I knew that if this works, it's gonna work big. Yep, no, you were four or five steps ahead of everyone. In 1979, Stacy had finally found enough skateboarders to start the Bones Brigade. And like, even even just the name alone was, was totally different to anything in skateboarding at the time. It wasn't like Buckinghamshire County Skateboarding Society. It was the freaking Bones Brigade. Stacy was clear he wanted to make something different. He wanted to make something that felt like a legit group of friends, not just a team. And the man behind the name Bones Brigade was this eccentric nutter called Craig Stesick. You know, you do what you do, and then you spend the rest of your life trying not to do what you don't, which takes up more time in doing what you do, which is yeah. the irony of a place like this. Craig was like an artist and a photographer. And George Powell, you know, the more sensible engineering mind behind Powell and Peralta, he could never really understand why Stacy was so fixed on having Craig involved in their brand. And Craig, who I brought in, did everything he could to get George not to hire him. <laughs> by being difficult, you know, because that's the way he is. He, he wanted to test him. But George, to his credit, let us do it. Six months later, we start winning awards for the ads and business is increasing. And he realized, wow, this is working. I get it. Stacy could see the genius that was Craig Stessick. And that was that Craig understood what skateboarding was, which I know sounds kind of stupid, but there is something I mean by that. Craig understood what skateboarding really was. If you can picture the early days, like no one in this period of time had anything to base the future of skateboarding on, other than these traditional sports like baseball, etc. Totally different to what action sports are. It was the imagery and it was ideas and it was a way to showcase their personalities. How did you know to do that? Or did you know to do that? Uh, I did know to do it because I was smart enough to hire Craig Stesick to do it because I knew I couldn't do it myself. And I knew that we had to break the tradition. They want a dream to cling to and we were there trying to create a dream, a mythology about our company. How did you know that? You were young. Because when I was young, I was searching for that myself and I didn't find it. of like foresight and vision you would need to be able to see that in a time where that didn't exist. Like it's easy for us today to look at things like extreme unicycling or parkour and be like, yeah, that makes sense what they're doing and that people would do that. Back then there was no roadmap for sports to grow other than just purely through competitions. And there's some people that even accredit the idea of like content marketing to people like Stacy. Content marketing being the idea of like selling a product by not singing the praises of the product. Like, ah, oh, look at this door handle. It's a really good door handle. It, it moves. It opens doors. But rather by making these incredible pieces of content and attaching your brand's identity behind the image that that thing would give. In 1984, Powell and Prot would release their first ever video entitled Bones Brigade Video Show. This thing being accredited as like the first ever proper skateboarding video. With a $15,000 budget, Powell and Prot are expected they would maybe sell like 300 copies, but they ended up selling 30,000 copies and it became a classic. <laughs> This video showed not only the insane skill level, but the banter, the lifestyle, the camaraderie of this die-hard group of skateboarding friends called the Bones Brigade. After the success, they followed that up in 1985 with another video called Future Primitive. In 1987, they dropped the film that would absolutely blow up called The Search for Animal Chin. In this video, they built a full-on massive ramp out in the desert. The film was super wacky. It had this whole narrative. Way, check that out. But nonetheless, th this thing was iconic. Toward the late 80s to early 90s, the Bones Brigade guys would become 
straight up celebrities, making insane sums of money off of like royalties from selling their skateboards, appearing on TV and films, winning competitions, traveling around the world, these guys were doing it. And Stacy had in some ways become like a father figure to these guys. He was there for them, he would coach them, he would help them develop them, and he would instill in them a work ethic and a seriousness towards what they were doing. And by 1989, Powell and Peralta were making $30 million a year. All this hard work over the last 30 odd years of Stacy's life was it was paying off. You can probably tell by now, but Stacy has this ability to like predict and see where trends are going. I'm also looking at the field. Who's new? Who's doing what? Who's dropping out? Who's coming up? Who can I count on? Who can I not count on? And that's because he's incredibly observant about how the industry works. And he could see that these skateboarders that he had handpicked from a young age, he could see that they were growing bigger than Powell and Peralta ever could. And Stacy was starting to notice a trend happening in the skateboarding industry of these big name skateboarders leaving the big brands and going to work for smaller brands that they could be a part of and make way more money. Stacy knew it was, it was only a matter of time before the Bones Brigade guys did the same thing. And so he bought this to George Powell. He told George that these skateboarders were inevitably gonna quit, go off on their own and make their own brand. And so Stacy had the idea, he thought, how about we create the brands for them? We help them get set up, we help them with distribution, manufacturing, all that sort of stuff that they were good at, but give them the company, let them run it how they wanna run it. And for Powell and Peralta to take a small percentage. But George, he was having none of it. He had a, a different vision of the future for Powell and Peralta. So this led Stacy in 1991 to make a bold decision. He left Powell and Peralta. For the second time in his life, Stacy had quit an incredibly successful career to just go and try something new. And literally a year later in 1992, Stacy's predictions were right. Tony Hawk, who was Powell and Peralta's main asset, the biggest, most well-known and successful skateboarder on the planet, decided to leave Powell and Peralta and start his own brand called Birdhouse Skateboards. Bar like one skateboarder called Steve Caballero who, who stuck through with Powell and Peralta, the whole team left and went and created their own brands. But look, this, this wasn't bad news for Stacy. He, he saw it coming and he had already prepared for his next step in life. And so this boy started his third bloody career and became a filmmaker. After nine years and quite a few failed screenplays that never made it anywhere, Stacy had his first major success with the film Dogtown and the Z-Boys. She's going, your film is completely sold out. I go, are you sure you have the right people in the right film? She goes, there is such a buzz about your film. Everybody wants to see it. An entire documentary on like the origins of skateboarding. And not only did it win awards and put this story out there to the world, but it put Stacy's name on the map for being a very good filmmaker. And on top of that, in some ways, kind of revolutionized documentary filmmaking. Because like Dogtown and the Z-Boys was like this rough around the edges, punk kind of film documentary. And I don't waste a lot of time and I like that lifestyle. I don't make a lot of money doing it, but it's fulfilling to me. When I do the Hollywood thing, it's just nothing but meetings and talking and blabbing. Stacy would continue to follow his passion for filmmaking, going on to make the iconic Bones Brigade documentary. And has since then even branched out into non-skateboarding stories. He made a film called Made in America, which is all about the Bloods and the Crips, like the gang wars in, in America. Stacy has since become an incredibly respected filmmaker with 13 films under his belt. And Stacy to me is like akin to a kind of Steve Jobs, like an Elon Musk, you know, like these visionaries. Of course, doing very different things, but at the core of it, Stacy's hard work with Powell and Peralta, Bones Brigade, all he did for skateboarding, truly revolutionized and shaped modern culture as we know it. The groundwork that he had laid for the skateboarding industry has gone on to be valued now at a $2 billion industry. That on top of that, has established many other extreme sport businesses that without skateboarding probably wouldn't have existed. These sports all focus on a very similar thing of seeing the world as a playground. Skateboarding bore a new attitude to the world, a less refined, countercultural, anti-establishment view, able to make fun of itself and not being bothered by how polished and professional things look, but rather focusing on the raw, gritty reality of life. Skateboarding has evolved fashion, it's evolved music. This sport that in the early days was seen 
as society's reprobates, has totally permeated mainstream culture. You now have brands like Supreme or Vans, Thrasher, that celebrities wear, and normal people all around the world. The content marketing style of advertisement is like the standard for, for advertising these days. It's so common. And as I said at the start, Stacey Peralta, to me, is just always been such a role model. Through following his passions wherever they take him, making tough decisions when he needed to, being able to spot talent and nurture it, to foresee future trends, and to never be afraid to move on when something's over. If it wasn't for Stacy and his ability to see the potential for skateboarding and what it could represent in the world, I have no reservations in saying that the world as we know it today would look completely different if it wasn't for Stacy Peralta. Your awareness is the one thing the one thing that you can call your own that nobody else has. You have to pay attention to where you put your attention. And if you pay attention to it, you'll find it's kind of surprising. You have to treat your attention and your awareness as the most valuable thing in the world, because it really is. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. You can support me by picking something up over at jimmythegiant.co.uk, supporting me on Patreon or using the sponsor link below. Peace.